Now, friends, we're with Paul on his second missionary journey. We saw last time that he crossed over into Europe, a memorable, significant, revolutionary crossing, for it brought the gospel actually to our ancestors, that is, the ancestors of many of us. And we make no claim to any superiority because he did that, because generally God chooses the weak things, the things that are not, just to let the world know that he doesn't put it on a merit basis, but it's all because of his sovereign grace. And we thank him for sending the gospel over into Europe. Now, we saw that Paul went first to Philippi. Actually, he received rough treatment there. And yet a church came into existence that when we get to the little epistle of the Philippians, we'll find was closer to the apostle Paul than any other church or any other group of believers. Now, we find that he continues on. If you have our notes, you know we have a map of the second missionary journey. And you'll notice that now he goes across, still going west, into Macedonia, and he goes to Thessalonica. That'll be his next significant stop for missionary activity. But now I'm reading verse 1 of chapter 17. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where was a synagogue of the Jews. Now, Paul, as we've said before, he used the synagogue as a springboard to get into a city or a community. And it generally led first to those that were there, and always some believed. Never all, but some believed. And because the others rejected him, it just gave him a springboard and pushed him right out to the Gentiles, and then some of them believed. And a church would come into existence, a local church. Now, notice these places, Amphipolis. What do you know about it? Well, the name means an all-round city. Now, most cities, you know, were built square. This one was like a round house. The wall around it was round. And it was on the Ignatian Road, a very prominent thoroughfare, a Roman road through that area. It was three miles from the sea, and it was 500 miles from Hellespont to Drachion on this road. That road was that long, and it was a very prominent thoroughfare. The Roman army went down it. The travel went this way. And also, traders went this route, and now missionaries. He came now to Thessalonica, and Apollonia, by the way, was also on the Ignatian Road. Then he came to Thessalonica, and it was 38 miles west of Apollonia on the Ignatian Road also. It was inland, but it was actually a seaport. There were three rivers that flowed into the sea from there. And it was a very prominent city of that day, a Roman colony. Cassander had rebuilt it in 315, and he named it now for the stepsister of Alexander the Great, and her name was Thessalonia. Some have thought it was named for the warm springs that were there, but apparently it was named by Cassandra, who was one of the generals of Alexander the Great, and he took that area at the death of Alexander. It was a Roman province, as we have said. Now, let's look at Paul's ministry in this city. Verse 2, And Paul, as his manner was, that is, this was his custom, he went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus whom I preach unto you is Christ. Now, that's very important to note, his ministry there. To begin with, it was a very limited ministry. He was there only three Sabbath days, which means he could never have been there longer than a month. 
And in that time, he did missionary work. Believers came to Christ, and a church was organized, and Paul taught them. And he taught them all the great doctrines of the Scripture, including the rapture of the church. And that's in his first epistle that he wrote to the Thessalonians. And it's the first epistle that Paul wrote, of any that he wrote. And he deals with this great subject of the return of Christ in that first epistle. Now, it means that Paul did quite a ministry there in a month's time. Notice, though, his message. He was opening and alleging, that is, from the Scriptures, that Christ must needs have suffered. He preached the death of Christ and risen again from the dead. He preached the death and resurrection of Christ. And friends, you will not find a message given in the book of Acts, either by Peter or by Paul, that the resurrection is not the heart of the message. And that is something today that just doesn't seem to be the heart of the message. What we talk about today more is the cross, even in fundamental circles. But my friend, we have a living Christ today. And actually, as someone has put it, there's a man in the glory, but the church has lost sight of him. And the Lord Jesus is yonder at God's right hand at this very moment. That's very important. It's one thing to talk about the historical death of Christ 1,900 years ago and his resurrection on the third day. But the question is, how are you related to it? That is Paul's great theme in Galatians, is what is your relationship to that? Is it meaningful for you that Christ died and that he rose again? Are you related today to the living Christ? Has this thing been meshed and geared into your life? Friends, that's Christianity. And very candidly today, we have conservatism, we have liberalism, but we don't seem to be getting through to him. Why? Why, every Sunday is an Easter. First day of the week, he came back from the dead. Every sermon should mention the resurrection of Christ somewhere in it. It's very important because... You see, when you mention the resurrection of Christ, you're talking about the man in the glory. <laughs> That's important to talk about the man in the glory today. And very frankly, that's not the emphasis. And you can't blame many of these men for the very simple reason. Get down any theology book. I studied Strong. I studied Shedd. I studied Thornwell, a Southern Presbyterian theologian, and I studied the great Dr. Hodge, may I say to you, any one of them, they have a long section on the death of Christ. That's important. Thank God they got a long section. But they got a short section, just a few pages on the resurrection. I think they missed the boat there. I think they should have put a long section in about the resurrection of Christ that was the basis of New Testament preaching. I've emphasized that because it's very important. He's there four Sabbath days. The resurrection of Christ was his message. Now notice the reception of it. Verse 4, some of them believed. That always happens when you give the Word of God out. Some will believe. And you know something? Some of them won't. The minority believes. The majority will not. Some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. And when Dr. Luke says not a few, he means there's quite a bunch of them, quite a bevy of the girls. They came to the Lord. How wonderful. Now, verse 5, But the Jews which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and we got some of those lewd fellows of the base of sort today in churches. And gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, 
these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Now, don't put that down as an oratorical gesture or hyperbole. When they said these are the men that's turned the world upside down, that's exactly what they meant. Did you know that when Christianity penetrated that old Roman Empire, it was a revolution? (laughs) It had a tremendous effect. And today, we don't see much revolution except in the wrong direction. It's too bad we can't have a great revolution and turn back to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the Word of God. That would be a revolution for this country today and get rid of all of the hypocrisy today. This pretending of we're a Christian nation and that our leaders are Christian and that all the politicians are Christians and everybody's a Christian. Why, my friend, we are in one of the most pagan nations that there's ever been in the history of the world. It's a pretense today. And we need to recognize we need to get back to the Word of God and this living Christ. How important that is. Now, will you notice? We find whom Jason had received, verse 7, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar. You see, it was a Roman colony, and they patterned after Caesar, saying that there's another king, one Jesus. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason, that is, he had to make bond, and of the other they let them go. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night under Berea, and coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. You'd think that that would dampen Paul down. That would slow him down. It didn't slow his tempo one bit. He's still going. He's now in the next town, Berea. That's down closer to the coast. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mine and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so. These people were reasonable. They searched the Scripture and there came into existence there a church. But you don't hear much about that church, but you do the one in Thessalonica. Isn't it interesting? The strongest churches arose where the persecution was the greatest. The trouble today is that the church is not being persecuted. The church is just taken for granted today. And the average Christian, well, you should take him for granted, because that's all he is, just to be taken for granted. They didn't do it in the first century. Now, will you notice... Therefore, many of them believed also of the honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. Here, Dr. Luke goes again. I love the way he does this. Why doesn't he say a great crowd, just a bunch of folk? Oh, he says, not a few. Well, if it's not a few, it means a multitude. And that's exactly what he means. Verse 13, But when the Jews of Thessalonica acknowledged that the word of God was preached to Paul at Berea, they came thither also, stirred up the people. And then immediately the brethren sent away Paul to go, as it were, to the sea. But Silas and Timotheus abode there still. Now Paul is going to continue on his way, and he's going to continue on his way alone. And they that conducted Paul brought him unto Athens, and received a commandment unto Silas and Timotheus, for to come to him with all speed they departed. Now, Paul goes on ahead to Athens and tells these men, you go back to Thessalonica, check up on the believers, see how the church is progressing, check here in Berea, and I'll go ahead and wait for you in Athens. Verse 16, now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. This is the cultural center of the world, Athens. And when you think of Athens, you think of culture. But it was a city filled with idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews and with the devout persons and in the market daily with them that met with him. I went down to that market. It's right at the foot of the Acropolis. And I can imagine... Paul walking up and down. He was a tent maker, you know. I think he sold a few tents while he's there. And while he's selling a few tents, you know what he's talking about, the Lord Jesus. 
the people began to get interested in what happened. Verse 18, "...then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him." Now, the Epicureans, their philosophy, it was more or less hedonistic. And the Stoics was, well, that's what it was. They were stoical. They believed in restraint. The Epicureans believed that you go the limit. The way that you overcome the flesh, the Epicureans thought, is just give it all that it wants. If you want liquor, drink all you want to. Sex... Well, believe me, the Epicureans could really join in the new morality. It's so-called new. wasn't even new for the Epicureans. And the Stoics, they believe you ought to hold the body under control. This was basically the philosophy of the two. Now, they came to him, and some said, What will this babbler say? They say, Might as well, Paul is sure a speaker. He does a lot of talking. Others, some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they thought the resurrection was the name of a god. You see, this was entirely new to them. Now, I hear people say today that Paul got his idea from Platonism, and that he really didn't believe in the bodily resurrection, but Platonism, that which was actually a spiritual resurrection, or more or less of the influence of the individual permeating society, and that type of thing. You hear it today, it's liberalism, and it's nothing in the world, of course, but old Greek philosophy. And so, these men, philosophers as they were, they didn't quite understand Paul. I think Paul was a little too deep for them. And philosophy had gone to seed in Athens at this particular time. Now they said they wanted to hear Paul. And they took him and brought him under Areopagus, that is, Mars Hill, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. Now I've been on Areopagus. It's a very peculiar formation of rock. That's at the base, actually, of the Acropolis. Up on top would be the Parthenon and the buildings that were connected with it. And in this, frankly, very lovely setting, beautiful buildings, statuary, but a city given over wholly to idolatry. Now, Paul is brought here to speak, and it's up from the marketplace there, too. It's a very interesting place. I think every preacher who's been there, except myself, has read Paul's sermon here on Mars Hill on top. And when I was there, why, another preacher began to read it. And I didn't like the way he's reading it, so I went way over to the other side of the rock, and I sat down with my Bible, and I just read it. It's a good place to go to read this that we're going to take up, but... Today, unfortunately, you and I won't be able to go to Mars Hill to read this. But let's put down some of the foundation here. Now, they said to him, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. You talk about being in the dark. These people were worse off than the Galatians or the people in Philippi or in Thessalonica. Why? Well, they thought they knew something. The hardest people in the world to reach with the Word of God and the gospel are church members. They don't think they need it. They think that on Skid Row that they ought to have the gospel. And they think that they've got a few friends that ought to have it. But these church members today, they don't think they need it. And they can be as mean. Oh, they can be mean and sinful. And yet they don't seem to recognize that they really need a Savior, not only to save them from sin, but to save them in their daily living, to make that count for God. Now, will you notice, they say to him, For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears. We would know, therefore, what these things mean. We'd like to hear you. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. 
And this is the way that America is going to seed today. You ever look at TV programs? Well, I do. I'll be honest with you, they're boring to tears. These talk programs are absolutely boring as they can be. Everybody's trying to come up with something new. They're trying to say something novel. They're trying to say something smart, something sophisticated. That's the same old story. The Athenians tried the same thing. And I think they had quite a bunch of hippies back in that day. They're not working. They're not doing anything. They're just talking, just talking new theories, new ideas. The human family always reaches that place of sophistication. They think they know something, and they didn't. They didn't know the most important thing in the world. And Paul had a great opportunity. Now, there are those that say Paul failed on Mars Hill, that at Athens he fell on his face. I totally disagree with that. I believe that this was probably one of the greatest messages Paul ever brought. In fact, every message he brought, I think, is the greatest. But this is a great message. Now, as we come back here to the 17th of Acts and verse 22, we've come to this great message of Paul on Mars Hill. And I want to read verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. Now, this is, as we indicated last time, this is one of the most, I think, remarkable messages that Paul ever gave. It's a great message. And he's very formal in the message, of course. He begins by saying, Ye men of Athens. Then he says, I perceive that you are too superstitious. And the word superstitious is wholly inadequate to say what Paul really means. What he says, I perceive you are too religious. They were very religious. Athens was filled with idols. The pantheon of gods that the Athenians and the Greeks had, it had no end. There were gods small and gods great and gods few and gods many. They had a god for practically everything. And Paul is saying, you're too religious. They had religion in Athens. May I say that you hear today sometimes this statement made, well, why do you send missionaries to a certain place. They have their religion. That's right. And I guess maybe somebody said to Paul when he went down to Athens, why are you going down there? They've got religion. Paul says that's their problem. They're too religious. They got too much religion. A preacher friend of mine years ago said, when I came to Christ, I lost my religion. And there are a great many folk today in our churches that need to lose their religion so they can find Christ. That's the great problem today. Somebody says people are too bad to be saved. That's not the problem. People are too good to be saved today. They think they're already religious. My friend, we're to take the gospel because men are lost without Jesus Christ. Now, that's the reason Paul is there. But notice he has a masterly beginning He doesn't go to a synagogue here. He has no springboard. And here is the place where he begins his message, and it's ye men of Athens. Now, as he moves along, he says, you're too religious. He says, for as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him I declare unto you. Now, there are two ways in which that unknown God can be taken. He says, I beheld your devotions, actually the objects of your worship. I beheld your altars, your idols, and your temples. In fact, that beautiful, lovely temple, the Parthenon, was a temple built to Athena. 
a virgin goddess, so-called, of the Athenians. And there were idols all around. And Paul says, I beheld all of this, and then amidst all the idols I found an altar, and it was to the unknown God. Now, that could mean that the Athenians were broad-minded, and they didn't want to leave anybody out. And if somebody came to Athens and said, how is it you don't have an altar to my God? And they could say, well, this one is really to it. We are broad-minded here. We didn't want to miss anybody. So this is to the unknown God. It'll be to yours. You can worship at that altar. Or it could mean this, that they recognized that there was a God that they did not know. Many pagan folk recognized that back of their idolatry there was the living and true God, but they couldn't get to him, and they knew nothing about him. That way back in the dim and distant past, their ancestors, somehow or another, did worship him, but they did not. And therefore, they go to these idols. They could have meant that to the unknown God. Now, Paul says, this is my springboard here. I want to talk to you about the unknown God, the one you don't know. And that was not as diplomatic as his first approach was, because the Athenians thought they knew everything. They were philosophers. The Athenians, they just talk back and forth. They are like a lot of college campuses today. That would have been certainly a typical place. And now, will you notice, Paul begins to talk about the God they do not know. Who is he? Well, first of all, Paul says he's the Creator. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Now, he makes something very clear that all the way through the Old Testament it's clear. Even when God gave to Israel the tabernacle and the temple, he made it clear he didn't dwell there. Solomon, at the dedication of the temple, he says they... Heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, and how can this house that we built? They recognized in the Old Testament that God, the Creator, the living God, couldn't live in a building that man had made. Man lives in a universe that God has made. And they thought that they could build a temple and God could move in. Now, will you notice, he says not only this, that he is the Creator, Neither is he worshiped with man's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things. And this, by the way, is a masterly stroke for him. He says, God doesn't need anything from you. You build a temple to him and you even bring him. The offerings were not so much to appease, but they wanted to feed their God. They wanted him to let them know that they were thinking of him, you know. And he says, God doesn't need anything from you at all. But the important thing is that he is on the giving end. He gives everything to you. He's given you life. He's given you breath. He's given you all things. The sun, the moon, the stars. You worship the sun, moon, and stars. While they worship the sun, Apollo comes dragging his chariot across the sky every day. Paul says, that's not it. That's something God made. And he made it for you. He gives these things to you. And he's the living God. And the one that gives everything to you is the one, by the way, that gives you salvation also. He not only gives physical things, he gives spiritual gifts. Now, will you notice what he says here? By the way, that probably were many altars to unknown gods in Athens. That, I think, has been established by Pausanias and Philostratus. Now he says here, and will you notice it, "...and he hath made of one blood." Now, so much has been made of this one blood business. I think that we need to dissipate any wrong notion you may have of that. He's made of one, one human family. Blood is not in the better manuscripts. He hath made of one all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now, 
God is the one that has not only created the universe, he's made humanity, one humanity. And that's important. Now, we're not talking about brotherhood here. The only brotherhood Scripture knows anything about is the brotherhood of those that are in Christ. Now, oh, there's a brotherhood of sin. We're all sinners. We stand on the same ground. He hath made of one all nations of man for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And he hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That's a very interesting statement, by the way. He is the true God, and he is the God that not only created the universe, not only created human beings, but he put them in certain geographical locations. Here is something that's quite interesting that certainly Paul couldn't have known from a medical standpoint. My doctor, who is a cancer specialist, says to me, since you're a blonde, you better stay out of the sun of California. I wasn't supposed to be out here. This was made for the darker races. You see, the light races are all up north where there's not much sun. The darker races are down where the sun shines. And that's the reason we have to be careful, some of us that are blonde, because we get skin cancer. We have to be very careful. God's the one determined it. I guess some of my ancestors should have stayed where they belong, but they didn't. And I guess I made the trip to California, and I'm glad to be here. But I may be out of socket, and I've got to be careful while I'm here and keep an umbrella up while the sun is shining. Now, that's just one instance. God has put nations in certain places. And did you know the thing that's produced the wars of the past is that nations... Just don't stay where they belong. They want somebody else's territory. That's been responsible for every war that's ever been conducted. If nations would stay where God put them, that would end war. That is the thing that's important. Now, will you notice, verse 27, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And this idea of feel after him means that they were groping after him. Man is not really searching for the living and true God, but he's searching for a God. And he's willing to stop on the way and put up an idol and worship it, you see. It doesn't mean he's looking for the living and true God, but he is on the search. Now, will you notice verse 28? For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said. For we are also his offspring. And not his sons, but his offspring, his creation. We are his creation. And what he's saying here is, and by the way, this is not pantheism, that everything is God, you see. For in him we live and move and have our being. But God is beyond this created universe. Now he says, your own poets. And one of the poets was Erastus in 270 B.C. He was a Stoic from Cilicia. And Cleanthes, I read when I was in college quite a bit of Cleanthes. He lived in 300 B.C. and he had a hymn to Zeus. And he speaks of the fact that men are the offspring. And what he means, and actually what he says is, that we're the creatures of God. That That's what man is. We're the creatures of God. That's the picture that's given to us here, that mankind is the creature of God. Now, will you notice, for we are also his offspring. Now, Paul continues on, "...for as much then as we are the offspring of God..." We ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. In other words, we ought not to be idolatrous. He's now going to present the true God to them, and the true God is a Redeemer. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, there was a time when God shut his eyes, actually, to the paganism. But now 
light has come into the world. And he asks men to turn to him. And light creates responsibility. And he presents the true God as judge for the future. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Now, God is the Creator, and he's the judge. Now, notice, because he hath appointed a day in the which he'll judge the world in righteousness. And when God judges, it'll be right. By whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, Paul presented what he always presented, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He presents him as judge, but the one who is the judge has nail-pierced hands because he's come back from the dead. And now, will you notice what took place here? All men, that he hath raised him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. You know why? Because Platonism denied the resurrection of the dead, friends. That was one of the marks of Platonism. They denied physical resurrection. In fact, this idea today of a spiritual resurrection, and that is something that is Platonism, but it's not Paul by any means. Now, they heard of the resurrection of the dead. Some mocked, and others said, we'll hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Now, this has caused the critic to say, well, Paul failed that. He didn't have any convert. Oh, wait a minute. Why don't you read the next verse? It says, How be it certain men clave unto him and believed, among the which was Dionysius, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And so Paul had quite an aggregation of converts in the city of Athens. And my friends, when Paul the Apostle went to a place and preached the gospel and had converts, he didn't fail. He succeeded. And Paul did not fail in Athens by any means whatsoever. Now we come to chapter 18. We're still on the second missionary journey of Paul. Now, he waited around in Athens. He's alone. He's waiting for Timothy and Silas to come and join him and bring reports from the church in Thessalonica and Berea. Well, what does he do after he waits a while? And he's had his missionary thrust in Athens. He goes on. And we're told in chapter 18, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and he came to Corinth. Now, I've made that trip by bus from Athens to Corinth. Paul apparently walked it. It'd take you a long time to walk it. And it's a beautiful walk, though, and lots more beautiful drive. By the way, you go by where the Battle of Salamis was fought at sea, where the Persian fleet was destroyed. You go by many historical places, and then you come to the city of Corinth. And Corinth was the most wicked city of that day. Now, when we take up these epistles where Paul wrote like he wrote to the Thessalonians and he wrote to the Philippians and he wrote to the Corinthians, I intend to give a background of the city and the reason that he wrote as he did and the message. But now, I just want to very briefly say that the city of Corinth was probably the most wicked city of the day. It was the Sodom and Gomorrah of that day, or it was the Las Vegas of that day. It was the place where you could go and live it up. Sex and drink and all other sensual pleasures were there. There are the remains there of a great Roman bath, and that's where they went to sober up. And there in the distance is the temple that was to Aphrodite, or to Venus, And there were a thousand so-called vestal virgins there. And they were anything but virgins. They were prostitutes. And sex was a religion. That's not new today. That was true back there. Corinth was one of the most wicked cities of the day. People came from all over the empire to the city of Corinth. They 
really could entertain you. They had two tremendous theaters there. Now, Paul came there, and here was his terminus of his second missionary journey, as well as his third missionary journey. And here, I believe, is where Paul probably had one of his most effective ministry. I would say that in Corinth and in Ephesus, Paul had his greatest ministry. Ephesus, a religious center, and Corinth was a sin center. And both of them were great commercial centers. Now, when he came there, what did he do? Verse 2, And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and he came unto them. Now, that was in the city of Corinth, this Jewish couple, and they were tent makers also. And they had been formerly in Rome. And the reason that they left Rome was one of these waves of anti-Semitism that has rolled like a wave over the earth. It rolled in that day several times in the Roman Empire, and this was one of them. And Claudius commanded all Jews to leave Rome. And they got out, and among them was Aquila and Priscilla, a very wonderful couple. And Paul naturally came in to them since they were in the same business. Notice verse 3. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So they had a great deal in common, as you can see. And so we find here that Paul says, verse 4, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. I think that Aquila and Priscilla took him to the synagogue. And he went there, and the custom was to call upon a visitor from out of town. And Paul got up and spoke. And we're told there that he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. Now, you'll notice that Paul waited around in Athens for Timothy and Silas to come. They didn't show up. He went on down to Corinth, and now they come. They bring him the report. And when we get to the Thessalonian epistle, you'll find out he wrote an epistle at this time. But now he feels he must speak out, and he testifies that Jesus was the Messiah. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I'll go unto the Gentiles. And apparently it was at this time that Paul made the break that took him to the Gentile world. From here on, it would seem that Paul's ministry was largely to the Gentiles. You find that true in Ephesus, and I think you find it true in Rome. Verse 7, And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justus, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. Now, you can see he had many converts among the Jews in that place. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Now, there was a great company, you see, of Corinthians that believed. Now, we're going to see what happened to Paul here, because actually he spent about 18 months in the city of Corinth, and he had a tremendous ministry there. We find now in verse 9, the Lord now speaks to the apostle Paul because he's coming into a new great dimension of his missionary endeavors. I'm reading now verse 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city." Now, that'd be about the last place that you'd expect that the Lord had much people in that place. I have been through Las Vegas quite a few times, and I'll be honest with you, and you look at that crowd, and if the Lord said, I've got much people in this place, 
I wouldn't question the Lord, but I sure wouldn't get that impression from looking at the people. And I'm of the opinion that Paul, who had been there for quite a while now, he's wondering about that. And I am of the opinion when he received this opposition, he was ready to leave and go somewhere else. But what happened? Well, the Lord now detains him. And he says, I want you here. I have much people in this city. And as we indicated before, this was with Ephesus, probably the two places where he did the most outstanding work in his ministry. Now we are told in verse 11, he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. For 18 months, Paul ministered there. Now, again, the gospel is going to cause opposition. And what happens in verse 12? And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Now, that's the Bema that Paul talks about in the first epistle to the Corinthians. And the second epistle, the Bema, the judgment seat. And I've been there. I've sat on it myself in the ruins of Corinth. And I have a picture made standing on top of the judgment seat that was there. Now, they brought the charge against him, saying, This fellow persuadeth man to worship God contrary to the law. Now, not the law of the Roman Empire and not the law of Corinth, but according to to the Mosaic system. Now, notice this, verse 14, And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it. For I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Now, notice this. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. Now, I have heard and I've read this man Gallio, he has been condemned in no uncertain terms that he was an unfeeling, typical Roman judge of that day, and on and on why it goes. I want to say for the defense of Gallio, I thank God for him, and I personally think that he took the right position. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. You see, he is probably the first one who made a distinction between church and state. Gallio said, now, if this concerns some religious thing, then you take it and handle it yourself, because that doesn't concern the Roman law, or I'm a Roman magistrate, and I will not interfere in religious matters. You will have to handle that. And he adopted a hands-off policy. Now, I want to say this, and I want to say it kindly. I wish the Supreme Court of the United States would adopt the same policy. Stay hands off when it has to do with religion. And this idea of prayer in the schools, why the public school in America was founded by Christians, and prayer has been made down all through these years. What right have a group of secular men to come along and make a decision that you can't have prayer in the schools, you see. I like Gallio. I don't know about you. He separated church and state, and he said, I won't interfere in that. If they're having prayer in school, then they can have prayer in school. And if they're not having it, we won't force it. You see, hands off. I like Gallio. I think that he did the right thing. He would not interfere with this man Paul preaching in the city of Corinth at all. Because he says, this has to do with your religion. And we are a city where you have freedom. You have religious freedom. And thank God for that. The unfortunate thing today is that this matter of freedom of speech has been abused in one direction, the wrong direction, And freedom of religion has been abused in the other. It's been curtailed because under the guise and the pretense that we are trying to separate church and state. 
Well, if you separate church and state, you'll keep your nose out of that which refers to the church. And if a school wants to have prayer, that's their business. And it's not the business of a little group of men in Washington or anywhere else. May I say to you that that's what freedom of religion is. And this man, Gallio, I'm going to vote for him if he ever runs for office, I'll tell you that. We need men with this kind of a vision. It says Gallio cared for none of those things. Well, of course not. He's a secular magistrate. He's not going to come into the church and try to settle an argument about predestination and free will. That's not his business. He'll stay out of that. Now, let's move on. Verse 18, And Paul, after this, tarried there, Yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and he sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sancria, for he had a vow. Now I find a great many folk, they really find fault with Paul because he made a vow. And they said, well, this man is the man that said we're not under law, we're under grace, and that he shouldn't have done it. Now, my friend, wait just a minute. Are you saying Paul shouldn't do this? Well, then you're making a little law for Paul, then, aren't you? And you want him to do it your way. Now, under grace, friends, if you want to make a vow, you can make it. And if you don't want to make a vow, you don't have to. Now, Paul didn't force anybody to. In fact, he said that you didn't have to. But if Paul wants to do it, that's his business. And that's the marvelous freedom that we have in the grace of God today. Now, it's not a relationship to a bunch of little cliches and laws that a few put down today of these super saints. They say, you can't do this and you can't do that. Now, I want to say this to you very candidly. The Lord Jesus said to me, if you love me, keep my commandments. And my relationship is to him, and I'm responsible to him, and I want to have fellowship with him, and I'm not going to come in your little wicket gate. I'm sorry. Don't tell me what I can't do. He tells me what I can't do. I'm trying to obey him. I want to follow him. I'm not going to follow you, and if I want to eat meat, I'm going to eat meat. If I want to observe this day, I'm going to observe this day. You see, whatever you do, do it unto the Lord. Whether you eat meat, meat won't commend you to God. But whatever you do, whether it be to eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. My friend, that's the important thing. So let's not find fault with Paul here either. My Gallio and Paul get in trouble right in this particular place, but I want to defend both of them. Now, will you notice that he's returning, actually, on his second missionary journey He's going back, having made Corinth the terminus, and he sails from Sancria. Now, Sancria is the seaport over on the east side. There is the Corinthian Peninsula, and there's a canal through there today. But there wasn't in that day. But they would pull the boats through there. I have a picture taken of where the rocks there are worn, where the boats were pulled over, that isthmus, and taken over to the other side. Now, Sancria was the port of Corinth on the eastern side. And so they go down there, they take ship. Now, he's not going west any farther, and he's sailing for home. And we find that what he did, Priscilla and Aquila went with him. And he's now made a vow, and he came to Ephesus, and he left them there. Now, they apparently... Uh, going to open up a branch store over in Ephesus. This matter of persecuting the Jew, the anti-Semitism of the day that drove them out of Rome has caused them now to go to Corinth and Ephesus both. And I think they just opened branch stores there. He came to Ephesus, left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews. Now, you remember when he came out, the Spirit of God wouldn't let him come there. But now he comes back by there. But he doesn't stay. When they desired him to tarry longer with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. Now again, somebody says, what business does he have to keep a feast? Well, notice his background. 
He's like Simon Peter. He has the background of the Mosaic system. He knows a lot of his friends are going to be in Jerusalem for the feast. And he wants to go up and witness to them. He says, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. Why? Well, under grace, if he wants to, that's his business. But I will return again unto you, if God will. Now, Paul saw that there was a great door open in Ephesus, and he had a missionary heart, and he wanted to come back there. And he sailed from Ephesus now. And Ephesus was a great city in that day. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. Now, he came into Caesarea, and Caesarea was the port, either there or Joppa, that he could go up to Jerusalem, make his report. Then he went up the coast. He'd been up that way before, and he came to the home church, which was Antioch. Now, Paul has concluded his second missionary journey. Now, notice he goes immediately into the third missionary journey. After he'd spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia. Now, this is his third trip through the Galatian country. And Phrygia, in order, strengthening all the disciples. Now, we'll find that he's going to come to Ephesus now on the third missionary journey. And that, again, is something... Very important to see. Comes to Ephesus where he's going to have a great ministry. But now someone else had come in there, and here's another great preacher in the early church that we don't seem to know too much about. And yet we can know a great deal about him. There are at least 12 things that are said about this man of Paulus, and to me they're all good. Now notice this. And a certain Jew named Apollos. Now he had the background of the law. And we're told he was born at Alexandria. Now, all of these things are in his favor. He was born at Alexandria. Now, he's first of all named Apollos. That's a Greek name. He was a Hellenist of the Diaspora. But he hadn't gone into Greece, or he wasn't in that area, Macedonia. He was born at Alexandria, and that's the north part of Africa, north part of Egypt. And it was founded by Alexander the Great, and it was one of the great centers of Greek culture. A great university was there. One of the finest libraries in the world was there. The Septuagint was translated there. A Jewish temple was there. One of the great centers of the early church. It was first Jerusalem, Antioch, and then Alexandria. Athanasius, Tertullian, and Augustine Three of the great men of the early church came from there. And Philo, a contemporary of Apollos, who mingled Greek philosophy with Judaism, Platonism and Judaism. And Apollos, obviously, was influenced by this background. Now, we're told that third thing, he was an eloquent man. He was a great orator, equal with Paul. And we're told here he was mighty in the Scriptures. And he came to Ephesus. That is, he was trained in the Old Testament. Now, we find the man was instructed in the way of the Lord. He had a formal education by word of mouth, not by revelation. Now, notice the sixth thing, and being fervent in the Spirit. Not the Holy Spirit. He had a passion for the things of God. This is the thing that is said about him here. Very frankly, friends... He was a great man. fact of the matter is, he was an outstanding man. Now, will you notice, he spake and talked diligently the things of the Lord. That is, what he knew. What did he know? The eighth thing is, knowing only the baptism of John. He never heard of Jesus. He just heard about John the Baptist. And he was a great preacher, but that's as far as he could go. And now notice the ninth thing. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them. They invited him home for dinner after the service because they saw he didn't know. And now the tenth thing, and they expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. They told him about Jesus. And now notice the eleventh thing. When he was disposed to pass into Achaia, 
the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. You see, he was a brilliant man, but up to the time that Aquila and Priscilla took him home for dinner, he didn't know the gospel of the grace of God. And here's a case where a woman helped a preacher a great deal. She told him something he didn't know. Now, notice the twelfth thing. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now, this is the man that's before us. He went before Paul into the city of Ephesus. Now, remember, they've only heard of the baptism of John. And Aquila and Priscilla witnessed that. 